Dr. Nicole Gormley, uh, who's with the Division of Hematologic Malignancies 2 at FDA. Um, and she's going to be talking about uh, surrogates in oncology. Nicole? Great. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicole Gormley. I'm the division director of the Division of Heme Malignancies 2 at the FDA. Um, and I was asked to speak with you today um, uh, about some of the surrogate endpoint considerations um, in oncology clinical trials. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present today. Um, it's really been um, a very interesting two days of uh, presentations and dialogue. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. So uh, just a brief outline and what I'd like to cover today. Um, so I'll, I'll start by sharing some of the regulatory considerations for biomarker development, and then I'll provide a couple of examples uh, with pathologic complete response um, uh, as one example, and then use of minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma. And then also lastly, just touch on some future directions. Next slide. So there are multiple potential uses uh, for biomarkers, um, such as minimal residual disease or pathologic complete response. Um, and they're generally recognized as prognostic biomarkers, um, but there are potential clinical and regulatory uses for these biomarkers. And while there is some overlap, um, the clinical and regulatory uses often have different purposes, and the trials and data needed to support its use in each of these settings um, are generally different. Um, clinical uses include monitoring for um, or screening for disease detection, um, monitoring for relapse, uh, guiding clinical decisions, um, therapeutic decisions, whether that be escalation or de-escalation of care. Regulatory uses include um, using uh, these biomarkers for stratification, patient selection or enrichment, uh, risk-based treatment assignments, and potentially uh, use as either intermediate or surrogate endpoints. Um, and, and with these regulatory uses, there's increasing risk such that there's relatively little risk associated with the patient stratification factor if the biomarker uh, is not uh, accurate or robust. Um, but there's um, significantly more uh, risk, potential risk, when it's used as an intermediate endpoint or surrogate endpoint uh, for regulatory uh, drug approval decisions. And we'll go through uh, some of these uses in more detail uh, in the upcoming slides. Uh, next. Slide, please. So there are three terms that uh, can often are used when referring to a biomarker as an endpoint. Um, the first is an intermediate clinical endpoint. Um, it is a measure of a therapeutic effect that can be measured uh, earlier than morbidity or mortality, but is still reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Um, and the second is a surrogate endpoint reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And then the third term is a surrogate endpoint. And then this final instance, the endpoint has been fully clinical, clinically validated. Um, the marker has been demonstrated to predict clinical benefit. And we'll go through the process of this clinical validation more in subsequent slides. But the first two endpoints are, are used to support accelerated approval, while the third you know, is used to support regular approval. Um, and while I'm describing here the process for establishing a surrogate endpoint, it requires clinical validation. The assay also that's used uh, should be analytically validated. Next slide, please. So there are various uh, considerations when thinking about development of an endpoint for regulatory use. Um, and next slide, uh, historically the Prentice criteria has been put forth as a statistical operational criteria to per, um, validate potential surrogates. But the Prentice criteria can be summarized as uh, one, the uh, requirement that the surrogate must be a correlate of the true clinical endpoint, and two, that the treatment effect on the surrogate should capture the full effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint. It's essentially the notion that the treatment is irrelevant for predicting the true clinical outcome if you know the surrogate outcome. Um, but it's generally thought that the Prentice criteria are too stringent and not really attainable, and as such, other statistical methods have been developed to validate with those uh, candidate surrogates. Uh, and one approach frequently used are, um, relies on meta-analysis. Uh, next slide. So when considering uh, a meta-analysis for validation of a surrogate, uh, there should be patient-level data from multiple clinical trials. Um, this allows for an assessment of the individual level and trial-level surrogacy. And when we talk about individual surrogacy, we're referring to correlation between the candidate surrogate and the true clinical endpoint on an individual level. 
And trial level surrogacy uh, is correlation between effective treatment on the candidate surrogate and the effective treatment on the true clinical endpoint. Um, but having individual patient level data also allows for determination of the surrogate threshold effect. And this is the minimum treatment effect on the surrogate that's needed to predict an effect on the true clinical benefit, um, which we'll go through this uh, in detail a little bit more. Next slide. When thinking about using um, a meta-analysis, there are several considerations in the conduct um, of a meta-analysis for potential surrogacy evaluation. Ideally, there should be inclusion of more trials as this increases the statistical rigor of the analysis and may allow for more interrogation of the data to address any uh, remaining uncertainties. There should be inclusion of trials with a wide range of treatment effects, both positive and negative trials, as this will increase the accuracy and then precision of the trial level surrogacy assessment. And then when designing a meta-analysis, um, consideration of an MRD or a specific uh, biomarker the timing um, of the assessment is, is really important and missing data uh, should be also um, uh, uh, assessed and, and, and accounted for in the analyses. And ultimately the trial populations and treatments included in the meta-analysis inform the future applicability of the surrogate biomarker such that there should be adequate information to allow comfortable extrapolation to other uh, settings. Uh, next slide. So I'd like to discuss uh, pathologic complete uh, response and its development as a clinical trial endpoint. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this effort was really spearheaded um, by the collaborative trials in um, neoadjuvant breast cancer group. And they conducted a pooled analysis of mature trials that had uh, both pathological complete response and long-term outcome data. Uh, next slide. So the objectives of these, uh, this analysis was to determine the association between pathological complete response and long-term uh, endpoints, such as event-free survival and overall survival. Um, also to determine the definition of pathological complete response that best correlated with long-term outcomes as several definitions were used in the clinical field at the time. Um, also to identify breast cancer subtypes in which uh, pathologic uh, complete response best correlated with long-term outcomes. And then to determine what magnitude of the pathological complete response improvement predicted long-term clinical benefit. Next slide. So ultimately, there were 12 trials uh, included in the analysis, um, and three different definitions of pathological complete response were evaluated in, in the pool analysis. And it was determined that absence of residual inv invasive tumor in both the breast and the axillary lymph nodes uh, was better associated with improved event-free survival and overall survival uh, than the absence of residual invasive uh, disease in the breast alone. Next slide. And the meta-analysis established that at the individual patient level, achievement of pathological complete response was associated with a substantial reduction in risk of death compared to those patients with residual tumor. So firmly establishing that um, pathological complete response as an individual uh, patient by uh, prognostic biomarker. Uh, next slide. But as uh, was stated earlier, trial level surrogacy measures precisely how the effect of um, the treatment on the true endpoint may be predicted based on the observed treatment effect on the surrogate endpoint. And at the trial level in this meta-analysis, there was relatively little association between pathologic complete response and the treatment's effect on um, either event-free survival or overall survival. Next slide. So in summary, next slide. Um, there was not, uh, next slide, um, a pathologic complete response association with long-term outcomes at a trial level, um, but this was observed on an individual level. So again, um, uh, indicating that it's a prognostic biomarker. Next slide. A standard definition uh, that includes assessment of uh, the node lymph nodes um, was recommended to be used in future trials based on uh, the results of this meta-analysis. Next slide. And the magnitude of um, pathologic complete response improvement that predicted long-term clinical benefit could not be established um, due to multiple uh, factors, possibly due to heterogeneity of the population uh, in, uh, included in the trials low attainment of um, pathologic complete response rates and, and lack of um, target therapies. Next slide. Um, so I'd like to switch gears now and talk a little bit about um, use of mineral residual disease and multiple myeloma and some meta-analyses that have been conducted. Next slide. 
So Langren and colleagues conducted a trial level uh, meta-analysis um, and four studies provided data in the evaluation of the relationship between minimal residual disease and progression-free survival. Um, and two had information that could be used for the relationship between uh, MRD and overall survival. Um, and overall, the meta-analysis showed that patients who achieved MRD negativity uh, compared to those that remained MRD positive had better progression-free survival uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.35. And those patients who achieved MRD negativity also had a better overall survival. Next slide. An additional uh, meta-analysis was conducted by the uh, data Harbor group, um, Dr. Munshi et al., um, and found similar results. And in their meta-analysis, they included 14 trials and used um, the evaluation of MRD and progression through survival. And then 12 trials were used for the overall survival analysis. And again, MRD with negativity was associated with the better progression free survival and overall survival. Next slide. So despite these trial level meta-analyses, next slide, uh, there are many remaining questions surrounding the use of MRD and multiple myeloma. Next slide. The first being, does MRD have trial level surrogacy using individual patient level data? Next slide. What threshold uh, best correlates with clinical benefit? Next slide. What's the appropriate, um, next slide. What's the appropriate timing of the assessment? And then also does sustained MRD better correlate with long-term outcomes? Uh, next slide. And then also, should MRD be assessed in only those patients that are in CR or VGPR? Next slide. So I'd like to discuss now um, the results of the Bellini uh, trial and, and present it as a somewhat cautionary tale. Um, so again, in multiple myeloma, um, the Bellini trial, next slide, was a phase three uh, double-blind randomized controlled trial of bortezomib and dexamethasone with or without venetoclax in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who had received um, one to three prior lines of therapy. Next slide. So the overall response rate was favorable um, in this trial with 14% absolute improvement. Uh, there was a 12% difference in MRD and the progression-free survival was also uh, statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.3. Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, the investigation of venetoclax uh, also demonstrated a worse overall survival uh, in this trial with a hazard ratio of 2.0 observed. Next slide. So when looking at the subgroups, it's notable um, that patients that had translocation 1114 um, uh, had a slightly different outcome. And unfortunately, there were only 35 patients in this subgroup. Um, uh, so it limits our ability to draw meaningful conclusions. But nonetheless, in this population, the progression-free survival hazard ratio was 0 0.1. Um, and although there were too few um, uh, patients, again, to draw any meaningful conclusions, the overall survival results um, did not seem to show the same detrimental trend that was observed in the non-selected population. Next slide. So next slide. Um, what are the implications of this? I think it underscores that we need evaluation of endpoints that can be assessed at early time points and late time points that provide definitive benefit, evidence of clinical benefit. Um, the Bellini trial, while showing these divergent results, um, I think, again, just sort of underscores the need for, uh, to be able to look at overall survival. And then additional information is needed before reliance on MRD as an endpoint in multiple myeloma. Next slide. Next slide. So I'd like to provide just a few more specific examples of uh, where we are with the use of MRD. MRD has been used to support accelerated approval in ALL. Um, and this was the aplinitumumab approval for MRD positive B cell precursor ALL. Um, and that setting, the approval was based on MRD response rate and hematologic collapse free survival. Next slide. Um, MRD results have been included in the prescribing information in CLL and both uh, venetoclax and venetuzumab uh, labels. Next slide. And they've also been included in the prescribing information uh, in multiple myeloma in daratumumab label, Bethesma label. Um, but it's currently recommended as a secondary endpoint in oncology clinical trials in, in hematologic malignancies. The next slide. And then there's ongoing uh, group efforts uh, to evaluate um, multiple myeloma and uh, use of MRD as a potential surrogate endpoint. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, validated endpoints are needed for regular approval. Pathologic complete response and MRD are not valid validated surrogate endpoints, and there's existing uncertainty and remaining questions 
regarding these endpoints for regulatory purposes. Um, MRD, pathologic complete response, and other biomarker assessments and clinical trials should be discussed with the agency, uh, but the FDA is committed to working with the community on development of these biomarkers to help expedite drug development. Next slide. These are my acknowledgements. Next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, th thank you for that presentation, uh, Nicole. Um, I did have one one question for you too. Uh, um, you know, we we often um, uh, struggle with how to power a uh, confirmatory study um, and look to a quantitative model of the relationship between the biomarker and the outcome, and uh, and then you know looking at the. Um, uh, the effect of, of the treatment on the biomarker that we need to uh, factor in uh, as well as you know, trying to decide whether or not a confirmatory study is reasonably powered to show a treatment effect. I was interested in this, this surrogate uh, threshold effect concept. Um, uh, we have sort of modeled this as, you know, what, what's the uncertainty level in the, in, the, in the two relationships we have to deal with. One, one uh, you know, the external data that says how, how related the biomarker is to the outcome. And then, you know, what the confidence limits are on the effect of treatment on the biomarker. Um, and, and we use those things, uh, the confidence limits around both of those things as a way of um, uh, figuring out whether or not we think the confirmatory study is adequately powered. Your approach to a uh, threshold effect seems to be the same idea. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, that's just sort of um, the strength. If, if you do have patient level data, you know, uh, you can, uh, you know, make sure again that, you know, all of the, the terms progression free survival or overall survival are you know, um, defined the same way in these trials, um, some templates, et cetera. But then that can allow for an analysis to say, you know, what degree of change in MRD, for example, would correlate with, you know, what degree of change in, in the eventual, you know, outcome of interest, whether that be progression free survival or overall survival. Um, but it, it does require, you know, more granular analysis um, and data to be able to have comfort determining that. Okay. Th thanks again.